This is uh, first to uh, express our sincere thanks to Professor Kenneth Arrow for uh, his uh, presence here, such a highly distinguished academic, recognized as a world top economy scholar, participating in the 23rd edition of the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics um, lecture and sharing his research and substantial contributions to economics, both in width and depth, with our community at the Graduate School. From the Bank Sabadell, which I'm representing today, we're proud to contribute yearly to this lecture series, which enabled the school to be ranked in scientific output as one of the top worldwide primary, actually in the last rankings, were I think ranked number nine worldwide, uh, and top three in Europe, and clearly the first one in Spain. This is according to the REPEC uh, ranking. So uh, clearly this is an institution that uh, is uh, very well placed and very well recognized around the world, but also a very important institution in Catalonia. Professor Arrow develops uh, pioneering works in several fields, and today's lecture is based on the concerns of economy as a big and interactive information system. From Professor Arrow's work with uh, Gerard de Bruy, we know that such a complex system as an economy with a large number of agents can, under certain conditions, function efficiently thanks to the price system. In a way, prices, more precisely relative prices, can summarize the relevant information, needs, wants, and possibilities of very heterogeneous agents. But the economy is also a dynamic system, meaning that those prices not only move to reflect changes in agents' preference and incomes, but also changes about the agents' expectations of these variables. Um, information about what uh, some prices are containing, like maybe oil prices in July 2008, where the peak of the oil prices was present, or housing prices, uh, very well that here in Spain has been a very important, uh, relevant uh, information. But what kind of summary of information is that given? Well, if there is something we have also learned from Professor Aro is the importance of asymmetric information and of choosing the adequate discount factor when evaluating these issues in a dynamic setting. I'm sure that uh, Professor Howard today will bring some valuable insights on a new way of focusing on the flow of information and how this affects the markets and the actual economic environment. So today we have the extraordinary opportunity of having Professor Kenneth Arra with us. Professor Arrow's contributions to economic science are fundamental and wide-ranging. Most of what we do as researchers and the very way we think of economics today is permeated by his thought. But he's much more than a great economist and scholar. He has been extremely generous with his time and energies. He has contributed his talent, his advice, his ideas in favor of many educational and research endeavors all over the world. Wherever he's seen an opportunity to promote science, to help shape new avenues for intellectual advance, to support new institutions, he's been there. And it is an honor for all of us that he's now returning to Barcelona in support of our joint venture, the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. Kenneth Arrow's theoretical contributions are at the origin of almost any great turn in our way to understand the economy and to look at society in the last 60 years. So many fields were open thanks to his vision that we are all his heirs. I am especially grateful for social choice, but others will be for other basic f turns in the theories that they now build their work on. Ken, we are very proud and honored of having you here today, speaking about the economy as an interactive information system. Welcome back, and thank you very much. Thank you. And it is, as always, a great pleasure to be revisiting Barcelona. Um, it was already at the time I first came here a growing center for research in economics. It is now one of the world centers. The uh, fame and reputation of the scholars here at both universities, Autonoma and Pompeo Fabra, is worldwide. And of course, the <laughs> city of Barcelona itself is a major attraction to any uh, visitor. It's one of the most uh, 
uh, something inspiring about the city, the way the physical atmosphere of the city, in a way that uh, very few others. What I want to talk about is really kind of a vision of the economy. It's not my usual uh, way of trying to present a model, and the truth is I find it very difficult. In fact, there may be a fundamental problem in, in modeling what I want to model. It's the concept of knowledge itself. And the idea is that knowledge itself plays a very central role in, in the economy to the point that some of its phenomena, at least I would argue, I would conjecture, perhaps, are <coughs> dominated uh, by things having to do with, uh, with, with information, the development of information, the acquisition of information, changes in the information set. Um, I speak of information, perhaps the word belief might be a more proper thing. It's how people believe, because they act. People act on their beliefs. Um, now, the, we, there has developed, of course, right, right from the time of the classical economists, from Smith or Ricardo, and even from some of the French economists, some of them before that, um, a system of a, of a smoothly interlocking system prices emerge, and they, of course, since prices are the same to everybody, this has a characteristic, gives a characteristic flavor. Uh, I want to say how it seems to me, at least, that the concept of knowledge in the, in the context of an economy, well, actually in any social context, but for, for let's, let's confine ourselves today to just the economic, um, has sort of paradoxical elements which can give rise to the idea of instability, give rise to instabilities. Um, and that the extent to which our model of the economic system has failed, um, which it has in certain, no question it has in certain circumstances, um, may, may possibly be connected, but certainly is partly connected, and uh, maybe that's even maybe the main story, to the idea that action is based on perception, on, based on knowledge, on the acquisition of information, and on the problems involved in the fact that we are trying to learn about each other. You see, in, in, uh, uh, from when we're dealing with goods, we're dealing with each other. You have some people with goods and some people with desires, and some of the ideas to get these goods in the hands of those who desire them, and with that, and I mean, I'm putting in a very simple terms things that do will recognize utility functions and production possibility sets and markets on which these transactions take place. Well, in the same way, knowledge is also being transferred. It's being acquired. It's being produced. It's being uh, modified. It's modified in part by the actions of individuals within the economy. It's, and it's transmitted. And, with, and what, one of the things you want to know about information is what information other people have. So I want to know the information set of the opinion. So we're getting into a paradoxical situation, or at least a possibly paradoxical situation. I should say that I really started my graduate studies. I'm, I'll be a little, I'm going to be a little autobiographical, uh, which is something I try to avoid. But the, um, uh, I really started as a statistician. Rather than, rather than economics. We drifted into economics through statistics. I won't, won't bore you with the process. Uh, but um, mathematical statistics, which was emerging as a field then. Um, one of the concepts there was information. For, I mean, the, the, the simplest side is you have a sample, and the question is what you get out of the sample. But people began to see the sample itself was a decision, not necessarily a given. You uh, could decide how. Uh, how much to sample. Those are the, some of the people that were involved in industry were concerned with that. You have a bunch of goods, you want to decide whether to, uh, from your supplier, you want to decide whether to accept them or not. Well, you can decide how many to sample. So the, uh, the idea of information as, and, the, and of course, the reason you wouldn't do everything is because there's a cost involved. So you have, a, you have an economic proposition, namely of this cost to the sampling, a bit more, more the the more you sample, the more reliable your statements are. But of course, the, you, so you're graining in accuracy, but you're, you're increasing your cost. So it you know, sounds like ordinary economics. But there are problems with it. There are things which are not quite so 
uh, not quite so standard. And I want to come back to that. So the idea of information, the idea that, that's, that randomness leads to a value for information, of course, you can reduce your uncertainty by sampling in most cases. And if you, if you reduce your uncertainty, then you have a trade-off, and then you get the value. I'll come back to this point. But that's the, the idea that information becomes an economic commodity. What is a commodity, after all? It's something which is valuable and costly. If it's at zero cost, you'd, you'd, you'd get all of it. <laughs> you'd get, you'd get, if, it's, um, if it's of zero value, you wouldn't bother getting any. So it's got to be valuable and costly. But we'll come back to the extent to which. So you might say, well, OK, we have a bunch of commodities. Let's add information. It's kind of an input into your production processes or maybe into your, but, to more, but the, to, there are some problems with that. And that's where the, the problem, can you extend the idea of a market to include Information. Informational structures are, are shaky, but they're extended and they have iterations in them. And I think well, I'm only advancing hypothesis that these iterations can, well, can can lead to sudden collapses. They certainly have over and over again. So it's a question of if should we know it's true in practice. Usual question: Can we make it true in theory too? Thank you. <laughs>